Thank you. Um, it's a privilege and an honor to be here to speak with you today and share some of my thoughts on what I think we should be doing as librarians in regards to everything you've just heard about and all the movements that are afoot. Um, a little background, I, my first encounter with any of this really was um, when I was a very early career librarian in 1996 at a North American Serials Interest Group uh, conference that was held at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. And it was the closing plenary session and Paul Ginsparg, who was then at the Los Alamos National Laboratory, and Dr. Stephen Harnad were the speakers. And they were speaking under the topic headlining, Proposing New Serial Frontiers. And Paul Ginsparg was talking about basically the archive that became ArchiveX, which is now at Cornell. And Dr. Harnad um, talked about the Faustian bargain of scholarly research publication and the development of scholarly skywriting, which was basically a precedent to open access. And what was most amazing about this closing session was that the Q&A went on for an hour and a half after they finished speaking. Um, the room it was one of the, the highest attended North American Serials interest group conferences that was held. And the room had every name that you could think of in publishing at the time. Um, and each one of these men, one by one, would pop up and throw out another idea. And Ginsberg and, and Harnad would knock it back at him. And they, it just went on and on and on. And it was actually just this brilliant moment of brainstorming where you could see in everybody's minds, like the gears starting to turn and the light bulbs start to go on. And it, the energy was just really palpable. And it was like, I was sitting there as this early career librarian going, wow, if this is the career I'm in for, I am so in. <laughs> this is really exciting. Um, and so what do I mean by hybrid OA? Because um, am I not just talking about gold OA? And I think there's a lot of confusion around about this. According to the definition for gold open access from our most trusted reference source, Wikipedia, um, actually hybrid isn't necessarily gold OA. Gold OA is really truly uh, a full journal that is open access, that is made open access by any myriad of, um, of um, business model. And there are, I think, in the open access market, just as many business models as there are in the for fee market. Um, and so Sherpa Romeo doesn't even have gold listed as one of their color designations. So it's kind of interesting that this color has suddenly popped up and that we're now talking about it. Um, in our information glut of the 21st century. Nicholas Carr describes it, instead of searching for that needle in the haystack, we're now dealing with um, a stack of needles that we have to sort through and figure out which ones we really need to get our job done. So I think what I'm talking about in this nest of needles are some little flakes of gold that we have to figure out and sort through and decide what we're gonna be doing with them. I work with this uh, fantastic group of librarians who run a relatively new conference in the United States called the Electronic Resources and Libraries Group. And they just had their ninth annual conference. Uh, the closing keynote speaker for this year's conference was Rachel Frick, who's the director of the Digital Library Federation from the Council on Library and Information Resources. And Rachel did this fantastic presentation uh, that was entitled The Courage of Our Connections. And one of the things that she hit upon was this mission given by David Lankes in the Atlas of New Librarianship. And, and this I will read because I think it really resonates to what our role should be in all of this going forward. And it's this, the mission of librarians is to improve society through facilitating knowledge creation in their communities. And one of the takeaways from Rachel's presentation is that basically if this is not your personal mission statement as a librarian, then you've kind of missed the transition of where we're at in the 21st century. 
And this is really what we need to embrace within our profession. Um, along with this, on the flight over here, um, I usually just stay up and watch one movie after another. And one of the ones that was showing on the plane is this documentary called The Bones Brigade um, about a pro skateboarding group that kind of came out of California in the late 90s, early 2000s. And one of the people that they interviewed to talk to um, is this brilliant guy, Rodney Mullen, who um, was a pro skater from the age of 12 to 17 and won more awards than any other skater prior to him. And one of the things he talks about is you can't let anything poison your individuality and you've really got to look inward, not outward, in order to express your uniqueness. And I think we heard this also from Dorothea Salo uh, at the 2010 UKSG conference when she was talking about we really need to focus our collections on what's being created locally and really champion that as opposed to trying to collect all this other stuff that's out there in the world and bring it in. We really need to be generating what is occurring from within and put it out into the world. Um, Rodney goes on to talk about his use of libraries at one point, and it was kind of interesting because I was expecting it to be about skating up the facades of them, but he actually uh, spent a lot of time in library stacks, and one of the things he talked about was looking at what he referred to as unreadable masterpieces that people have dedicated their lives to creating, and you think about how these books will change society and they, how they will factor into things. And I really think, as librarians, we have to ask ourselves, what are we doing with our collections to help to facilitate societal change? And how can we make these great works factor into the everyday lives of people? One of the other things that uh, Rachel mentioned or quoted from was actually Scott Pluchak's uh, Janet Doe lecture at the National Library of Medicine in 2011, and we're very fortunate in that you're going to get to hear more from Scott directly on some of his ideas that I think are highlighted in this talk, but there's one quote that I want to give from that. He said, library advocacy for open access has, unfortunately, taken on the form of an adversarial advocacy that demonizes publishers and uses rhetorical shortcuts to gloss over the structural complexities and ignore the true complex of interests that need to be carefully balanced if we are to achieve a mature and robust digital scholarly communication enterprise. And I think, you know, we really have to get beyond our emotion with this and start working on the practicalities of how we are going to move forward. So the three things that I want librarians to walk away from, from my speech, is that open access provision does not mean that access is provided with absolutely no cost associated with it. There are business models in use with open access publishing, and they are as varied as our for fee business models. Even within our own community, there are multiple ways to produce open access content, and each comes with variable costs to that producer. Second, open access publishing, whether it's done at your library or outside of it, still needs to be organized and managed. And I don't know how many people are familiar with the Education Advisory Board's Redefining the Academic Library Report. This was uh, fundamental in the United States in the past four years, I think. And it was promoted out to a lot of our provosts. And basically, it was saying that because we live in this glut of information that Nicholas Carr has talked about, that really we don't need libraries anymore because the information's just there. It doesn't need to be managed. It doesn't need to be handled. Um, it's readily available, and people will just find it. And what we're learning and what we are discovering is that's not happening. We do have a role to play here. Uh, one of the other things that Rachel Frick said in her closing keynote at ERNL is this is the golden age of catalogers. We need catalogers now more than we've ever needed them before. But it's also come at the tail end of the great depletion of technical services. And so we're in this quandary. Our skill set really is managing and organizing information. And yet 
at the same time, we're kind of being told that that skill isn't necessary anymore. And we have to, we have to really advocate for what we can do. The third thing I want to really impress is that open access within your institution is an enterprise-wide endeavor. And this is especially true within the library itself. Whatever you do, do not create another silo of management, a digital scholarship program, a scholarly communication division, whatever you want to call it. Because honestly, everyone within the organization needs to be brought to the table regarding open access provision and management, and everyone needs to be working together for us to move forward successfully. So let's take a look at what we're currently facing. Here's a representation of the current output of article production in the world. Between the OA mandates, well, not really mandate, between what's going on in the UK, what's going on with Horizon 2020 and the, the European Union, and the mandates that are, or the, the things that are coming about in the United States and Canada, the percentage of OA publishing coming down the pike at us is really growing. Um, at a lunch event at ERNL, Ex Libris's Susan Stern presented some statistics from the Outsell report, Open Access, Market Size, Share, Forecast, and Trends. And according to Outsell, 17% of journal articles published in 2015 are going to be open access. And 17% is not a huge number, but it is a significant number. And I think this really should be grabbing our attention. <coughs> in juxtaposition, Here's Portland State University Library's collection budget as adjusted from inflation from 1998 through 2012. And I'm sure many of you have very similar graphs in your portfolios as well. Um, our annual inflation rate hovers at about $150,000 US. Uh, when I worked at the University of Texas at Austin, our inflation rate was half a million dollars. This is unsustainable, and we all know this, and we've got to do something to address it. So when I started as the collection development librarian at Portland State, I really wanted to explore the viability of trying to establish some sort of funding for APC and for better support of open access. But I realized I needed to learn a lot more about what was going on in my campus with demand for open access. And I also needed to understand from the publishers what they were doing. Um, at the time, we really didn't have a viable option for publishing any open access content ourselves. And so I really thought that we had to be very thoughtful and pragmatic about how we move forward with what we were going to do. So I proposed a research project to some of my colleagues, uh, Sarah Beasley, who's the scholarly communications librarian at Portland State, Robin Champeau, who's the scholarly communications librarian at the Oregon Health and Science University, with whom Portland State has a um, partnership with now, and Cassia Stasek, who's the regional sales manager for Harassowitz. Um, we looked into initially looking at four main publishers, but then realized that was too small of a pool, and we took it out to eight um, publishers who've been involved with the peer research group, and they're listed here. Um, we ask a variety of questions regarding basic information on their hybrid programs, the structure of the programs, how they utilize discounts, how they market, how they license. And I'm going to show you some of the results. I'm giving you kind of an abbreviated version of a presentation we're going to be giving in about five days' time at the Association for College and Research Libraries. Um, but I don't think our findings are all that surprising to anyone. So here's the overview of the program names when they started and the numbers of journals that were, being, that were participating in 2012. These numbers have definitely gone up since then. And here's the cost figures for the publishing and hybrid OA articles, the four fees. Uh, Rich Van Nor Richard Van Norden just published a very thorough news item in Nature on 27 March 2013 entitled Open Access, the True Cost of Science Publishing. He quotes further from the Outsell uh, report that the average cost with discounts applied for hybrid open access article publishing to be closer to $660 without taking into account any revenue. Um, 
The publishers here are going to argue that their infrastructure costs, coupled with impact rating and the prestige of the journal, add to the overall costs charged per article in hybrid publishing. And the argument, these arguments that the amounts charged are the cost of selectivity, prestige, and impact. And I really think this is an area where we as librarians need to be questioning that. And really, is that what the cost of prestige and selectivity should be? Ultimately, my survey team kind of suspects that the publisher pricing focuses a bit more on looking at what the competitor scale is than what was really disclosed to us in our survey. Um, I think there are publishers that are pushing the envelope to see what the market will bear. And so we really need to be questioning this and asking four different uh, amounts as far as this is concerned. Um, with the exposure of the outsell report then, I mean, I think it's contingent upon us to advocate and argue for more, more sustainable practice as far as pricing. Um, within the academic community, librarians and faculty need to agree what is the price we're willing to bear for prestige and selectivity. Librarians need to make apparent what the OA costs the library budget will bear and what OA costs are going to come from elsewhere within the institution. So this is what could best be known as the double dipping expose. This slide outlines how the publishers share information on what discounts are applied from hybrid publishing. By far, MPG and Oxford are the most transparent in their disclosure. Um, Oxford even goes so far as to print the discounts within their yearly price chart that they hand out every year. Um, and both of them are given global discounts where not everyone is. Um, Double dipping is probably the biggest point of contention with many librarians in the hybrid OA model. And that being said, I think this is the point where we have some of the greatest ability to negotiate. And we need to really figure out what model we want. And I don't think we've had a really firm discussion about that. Growth rate was a little hard to get at with the questions that we ask in our survey. And so despite various follow-ups, um, we kind of have this chart, which is sort of all over the place. Um, different publishers reported different time frames. And um, Oxford was really the only one who gave us a, a breakdown by subject category. So this is definitely an area where I think there could be further, further study done in our community. Marketing of the hybrid option is done by all publishers on the journal website. And there's a mix on whether the marketing is also done at the point of article acceptance or article submission. In general, an author is given the hybrid OA option at one of those two points. At the time of our survey, all the publishers were using some variation of Creative Commons licenses. And that's actually changed quite a bit since we initially surveyed. And I think that's definitely become a big point of contention for us and another point where we can lobby for what we think the market should bear. Tracking of hybrid OA is a big problem both for publishers and for librarians. Um, I think this is definitely a place where we can come together and collaborate to create a better mechanism for tracking. Dan Tonkery was another keynote speaker at ERNL, and he provided the audience with an insightful presentation on how different it is for publishers to pull information from their fulfillment databases and how vastly different those are from what we're used to as librarians with our integrated library systems. We have these descriptive catalogs that tell us all this information about all our resources. They're dealing primarily with financial data. And so these are two very different data structures. And I think we sometimes forget that when we're having conversations. And we're just like, what do you mean you can't give me this information? Um, it kind of makes sense when you think about it that that's what they're going to be focused on. Because financial management is the most important aspect for them. I think FundRef will have an impact on better tracking of APC funding. And, you know, we've also got a granting agency like the Wellcome Trust, which is, it's this, 
insists that there be a third party system in place to actually manage the payment process between the academic institution and the publisher. Part of the reason why GIST has started promoting open access key or OAK. And, you know, this is a great role for subscription agents to get into, um, but we haven't really seen them in any consistent large scale way step into this void just yet. Um, another key point that Dan made at ERNL is we really do drive standards uptake by publishers. And we shouldn't expect the standards to just be there. We need to be really pushing for the utilization of ORCID, the utilization of FUNRAF, and the usual utilization of counterfor statistics. Uh, when we were doing the survey, really there was only one publisher that was MPG that put forward that they were trying to work on getting counter for statistics working for them to report out what was being accessed as open access. And I don't know of a single publisher out there that's counter for compliant at this point in time. So this is definitely something that we really have to push for. So all in all, the tracking of hybrid OA, um, how it's done just leads to difficulties for us. And we're not going to get lists from the publishers. It is our responsibility as librarians to be the record keepers and to be able to get at this information. Um, we, were at, we did ask as part of our survey to get lists of what had been published by Portland State University and the Oregon Health and Science um, University. And we got reports from three publishers. One basically had a mechanism that told us to look it up ourselves. And um, there were three that just couldn't provide any information whatsoever, given the way that they're currently tracking things in their system. Again, this is a great place for subscription agents to step in and start um, providing a service. And they, they have started to do this with some individual institutions. But it's not being done in any large scale. And so we're kind of having to, to do this on our own at this point. So why should we care? Why should we even be playing a role in this? I think it's because our faculty drives this market with their content creation, and they want to continue to publish in the four fee journals. Uh, their infrastructure systems of peer review and promotion and tenure have not changed at this point. And when there is a societal shift in academia away from the current metrics of what counts and what is recognized as quality, then we can start promoting stepping outside what Dr. Harnad calls the Faustian bargain. But the fact of the matter is, these publications are where our content creators want to create their works. We need to influence the change in academia, but not just within the publishing community, which is where we've been focusing most of our attention, but actually within the academic community. Um, we have connections already in place with scholarly publishers and with societies. Um, and we should promote the publishers and the societies that we think are doing the right job. And we've tended to shy away from that when faculty come and say, where should I publish? Um, and early career faculty oftentimes do come to their librarian and say, where do you think I should be publishing? And we generally hem and haw and say, ooh, that's not where we should be really making recommendations. But I think we should. I think we should step up to that. Um, we need to be part of this ecosystem, and this is the way that we can do it. I think we also have fantastic experience at article level processing, unlike the rest of our campuses. Um, and we do it primarily right now through interlibrary lending and some of our demand-driven acquisitions processes. But quite honestly, that could easily be flipped to be like dealing with APC charges and, and dealing with supporting hybrid OA. Um, we know how to manage scholarship at this sort of discrete level. And I think librarians, more so than anyone else on our campuses, generally have the best purview of what's going on there. And we know what programs are being offered when new programs are developed because we see the demand come in for resources. We also know how to budget fairly and pretty accurately across disciplines and subject areas. I mean, it's the business model that we've been in as a library for pretty much most of the 20th century, and we just need to fine tune it to fit the 21st. Yeah. 
So where do we start? We sit down and have this conversation at your institution and identify who the key players are, both within your library and at your institution. Um, don't wait for the conversation. Don't wait for the invitation. You make the invitation and send it out to the rest of campus. Um, I think we've also got to redesign our budgets and develop funding for content creation as our core funding need. And then reevaluate what the research resource demand is and where we can switch over to article provision there. And um, always leave the little top part for the things that you least expect. I think we need to learn the standards and promote them. Um, Elsevier's Connect just had a great brief news piece on how librarians are promoting ORCID at their respective institutions. And we really have to get into the marketing and promotion game. And I think that's something that, again, we as a profession haven't been too good at doing. And we should follow what NISO is doing, especially since they have the new working group on the open access metadata and indicators. Tracking is not easy. Citation tools don't indicate what's open access at this point. Um, we basically have to go through and try to cross-reference what we know is being published on our campus with what's in the citation tools. And again, a lot of what's being published might not be indexed. It might be gray literature. It might be in other areas where we're not seeing that publication. Um, we have to make new new connections and new stakeholders on campus. Once you find out where the information resides, find different ways to pull it together that works for you. Um, we can't rely on the publishers to do this for us. And it's okay if we miss a few things. We're gonna do that, especially early on. We'll eventually learn how to pull things together. I think this goes back to the statement of we can't wait for things to be perfect. We have to start moving on them now. I really am anti creating a whole separate processing stream or team for dealing with this. Um, Rachel Frick, one of her comments in her presentation was, data and local content is everyone's job. And I think that's absolutely true. We all need to own this and we all need to be working together on how to make this provision happen. Um, if we cede this to another management area on campus, what we're doing is we're basically giving up our area of, of likelihood and we're, our, we are diminishing our purchasing power because we can't track things the way we need to to make sure the discounts are being applied justly. Um, with librarians being the point of contact for hybrid OA, I think we can then start to push for greener mechanisms. And that we can, it really helps bring the conversation of open access publishing in total out to the community that we work with. So I think management of open access publishing is an investment that we're making, not just in our future as librarians, but in the future of the scholarly publishing ecosystem. Our strengths lie in our ability to organize and manage resources well, and we should invest heavily in our strengths. Um, supporting open access publishing, whether it's hybrid, green, or gold, is an enterprise endeavor, and we need to gauge everyone in this effort. I think librarians have been handled, handed this golden opportunity, and together, let's make this investment worthwhile and successful, and let's not squander it. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. <laughs> You've left two minutes, yeah. Um, there's uh, time for a quick question or two. We're back there. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Mike Taylor from Elsevier Labs. I'm not responsible for setting APCs particularly, um, but a couple of weeks ago we published different prices and policies, including a very strict policy against double dipping. Um, if you go to elsevier.com slash open access, there's a lot of information there. Well, that's it. Thank you. Any question or other comment or repost? Yes, there's Lorraine down here. Got, it's okay, Brian. Thanks. Lorraine Estelle from Just Collections. Um, Jill, a very interesting presentation. Um, 
And you're talking a lot about the role of libraries and the work that libraries need to do. Um, but do you not think if we're paying these very high APC charges that much of that responsibility really lies with the publishers? I think, I think we need to really work at getting at the price point that we can agree upon. And when we are paying a subscription and then we have these APC fees come up, we should really be going back to the publisher and saying, you know what, if we're going to pay these fees for these articles this year, then that needs to be subtracted out of our subscription or else we're going to do an either or proposition. I think we need to start making some pretty strong demands along those lines. And the only way we can do that is if we actually know what those APC fees are. And when it's another area on campus that's paying for those, like our grants office or somewhere else, we're not always knowing that that sort of um, cost is being incurred. 